when did I feel that I was really an artist? I don't remember ever not knowing that I was. When I was in grammar school and high school, my parents used to buy me a lot of paper and poster paints and things, and I would come home, spread everything out on the dining room table, and just paint and paint and paint and paint. I don't know where any of that work is. It's all it all got thrown away, but it was the it was the desire to do that. But I'll tell you an unfortunate story that led to something good because I became a teacher myself. When I was in high school, when did I feel that I was really an artist? I don't remember ever not knowing that I was. When I was in grammar school and high school, my parents used to buy me a lot of paper and poster paints and things, and I would come home, spread everything out on the dining room table, and just paint and paint and paint and paint. I don't know where any of that work is. It's all, it all got thrown away. But it was the, it was the desire to do that. But I'll tell you an unfortunate story that led to something good because I became a teacher myself. When I was in high school, I decided to take an art class. And the teacher set up a still life and she said to just go ahead and paint. So I changed things around and probably added things or took things out. Anyway, when the teacher saw it, she was furious really angry and I although I finished the semester and I never took another art class I just was I I think what happened then was very serious in as much as I was always and you know, still am afraid to show my work to anybody I'm very very I will do it but it is very hard for me um, but when I became a teacher I decided that that was never going to happen uh, and so the lesson in that for me was was a good turned out to be a good one. My mentor at the University of Maryland was uh, Professor Jameson, and he was a very interesting man. He had been asked by the government to go to Vietnam and do drawings of the battlefield and so forth. And because he was such a sensitive man, he did not come back the same person. I think he saw war and brutality, cruelty that none of us could imagine who haven't been on a battlefield, and he recorded it, he drew it. Um, he could drew, draw beautifully, and I basically, I did a lot of drawing classes with him, uh, and, I, and I loved to watch him draw. Sometimes he would get, I've forgotten the name of the machine, but he would draw so we could watch him on the screen. And um, he taught me. He taught me a great deal. And I think he he appreciated me as an older student. And he he was instrumental in helping me get into graduate school because I didn't apply until I was 40. And they had never before taken anyone at that age. Uh, they said you couldn't keep up. And he said she can keep up. And so he he was. And you know he. Shortly after I left Maryland, he took his life, which was very hard for me. Uh, I've been asked about a abstract art and the fact that I make it now, but I've always made it. I think I was making it as a child in my own way. I never was interested in... I envy people who can copy nature. I do. I Believe me, there are times when I wish I could do it, but I cannot do that. It's not in my nature, and I don't have the patience for it. I work very fast. I work from my intuition, and I have very little interest in copying nature as such. What I've always been interested in is color and light. And to, to a, a fairly large degree, texture as well. And that's going to show up as we talk about other paintings. Um, but color has been the thing that's interested me the most. And I'll tell you an experience I had when I was taking a class at a, like a community center with a, uh, an artist. And it was just a bunch of us. Some of the women were old and some were young. And we, none of us were anything but amateurs. But 
she took me out to get something in another room and she opened this cupboard door and it was full of yarn, colored yarn, from, it was a closet. There were shelves from the top to the bottom and it was full of colors. And I had an epiphany. I mean, it was like, it took me, it took me back physically. I think I just lost my breath. It, it, was, it was absolutely breathtaking. All right, I got to talk about this. People are going to really find this weird. But I did a painting, which turned out to be very successful. What, what happened initially? Oh, let's see, I'll go back. I was watching a television program. And there was a, the, the, they were doing an interview with someone. And there was a, a, a palm. I think it's called the Phoenix Palm. And it, they had this beautiful bend. And I thought, oh, I bet I could create that beautiful arch uh, in, in a painting. So, and um, I, I did this, I did reds and oranges and things, and I did this, and it didn't work at all. It was real bad. So I thought, this is a huge piece of canvas. I can't waste it. So I put it in the washing machine. And I washed the canvas, and, and I let it spin out so it was damp, and I laid it out on the floor, and then I thought, I'm going to use blues and greens, just more in nature, I mean, the colors that seem to go with the shape better. But what happened is that, and you don't see it right away, but the reds and things kind of tinted the canvas so it was no longer exactly white. And then when I poured these paints, Apparently, the dampness was just right because they just spread exactly the way I wanted them to spread, and they, the, the, the greens and the blues actually began to blend. And I, I had no control over it. it. It was just everything was, the situation was right. And it worked, and, and it's a painting that's quite a few people. Yeah, the Porsche paintings were a, a series, really, of rectangular, very rectangular paintings, um, which is, I, I mentioned because in the last few years I've only worked in square canvases, and I'm most comfortable on square. But I worked on them because I had made a trip to Stonehenge, and I was so affected by the standing stones. I think a lot of people are, of course, but I came back and I wanted to do something that had that sense of majesty and um, a, a permanence and 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 and, and age. I wanted to try to get some sense of age. I'd also been thinking a good deal um, <clears throat> about uh, the Merchant of Venice and the and the, the character of Porsche, Portia, um, who of course saves saves her fiance from being pretty much hacked to death. Um, at any rate, I, I, what fascinated me was the fact that it was sort of a feminist period for me, and her her father wanted her just to marry, you know, the most, the richest, so forth, prince. But she wanted to put them to a test, so she had these three boxes, um, and um, they were supposed to choose the boxes, the lead that's important. And, um, of course, the, most of the suitors chose the wrong box, and the, the right person chose the lead box. Um, the others, depending on how you symbolize those colors or metals, uh, chose for wealth or fame or you know, that sort of thing, property. And she wanted someone to choose for her. And um, so what I did was each of the three standing paintings, um, and, and actually I found that standing them on the floor instead of hanging them up was the, really the right way they belonged. They did belong on the ground rather than up in the air. Um, each one symbolized one of the, the boxes. And the process was interesting. It's something that I hadn't, I don't know where I, what gave me the idea, but... I've always had this in my painting desire to to cover and then reveal, to cover and reveal, 
And so I painted them, and I put on several layers, and then I took sandpaper, and I started sanding down to get the effect that I, that I wanted. And it was just right for me. It was just the right thing at that right at that particular time. And I repeated that in some others, like the Dreaming Pair, um, which um, is another set that's two paintings, which I really do like. This painting began as a, what I would call in a well, in a rather mechanical way. In other words, I had a plan. I went ahead and did it. That never works for me. I don't know why I ever do it, but occasionally I fall into that. And it was a it was a, a, a pattern with lots of colors, um, almost uh, in a rainbow range, with darker areas alternating. And the the painting to me was, although it was rather attractive, it was cold. It, 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 it did, didn't have a emotional content because it was too contrived and I don't some people work that way beautifully I can't work that way so um, it was actually after I had read the myth of Persephone um, and I was going to sleep that night that all of a sudden that painting for no reason popped into my mind because it didn't have a title and I hadn't looked at it for months and I thought oh my gosh I know what that painting needs it needs to have this very thin black wash so that the color comes through in a, in a much more important way and less, less obvious, but more importantly, through this black wash. It's very, very thin um, and the color kind of shines through. And, and Persephone just seemed like exactly the right title for it. Um, Persephone was kidnapped by Hades and taken uh, to hell where there was darkness and she was extremely unhappy and nearly died and so Hades in his concern consulted her father who said that maybe she could spend six months in the light and six months in Hades in the dark and so the deal was made and there's some talk about it explaining the, the, the change of seasons, the, the dark and the light, but the, the, I named the painting after I painted it, after I added the black wash, uh, because it was, it, it, it did an interesting way, the light and the color came through more importantly than it did without the wash. It suddenly made it focused I realized in, in these discussions on film that it explains the way I not only work, but the way I live. And it's this, um, because I've talked about how I put things down and take things away, put things down and take them away. And there's a, there's a sense of vulnerability when I put things down. Now that goes back to in some ways that that teacher I had who was so cross about what I had done and how afraid I was to have other people say and, and then then I want to cover it up I have this strong urge to cover it and I think that's the the other side of me that gets too vulnerable and has to recede and so I think I live my life that way and I think it's in my painting and I and it's only through this discussion that I been able to understand why I do that. And I, I, but I have really been dismayed that I didn't understand why I had this strong urge, but I really think that that explains it. I'd like to talk about two paintings today. They're two very different paintings in style, but they both were painted at periods of my life when um, things were not going very well or I was in great change. But in the case of the first painting, State of Grace, um, I, I went to the studio um, to, to work and much to my surprise, the painting that resulted was extremely calm and, and um, joyful in a what I would call a very d deep, 
quiet way. And I was so surprised that that painting could come out of me when I was feeling so differently. But I really think that it shows that that paintings do come from an, another place. My life had changed very abruptly uh, and I it just wasn't adjusting to that very well. Um, but painting was always a refuge for me so of course I went right to the studio to work and this painting happened very quickly, um, very intuitively, and almost painted itself. Um, and it's, it is acrylic on an gesso canvas um, and uh, it, it's just simply brush strokes and the brush strokes were very um, emotional for me, I guess you'd say. Um, and when I finished and I, I looked at it, I, I just couldn't. It was like someone else had painted it. Um, but it's always remained one of my, my favorite paintings because I think it came from a place that where artists really where artists really work. And that that I suppose I should say a few words about that. A lot of people try to talk about it and I don't suppose I can do any better, but there is a place from which artists work um, that is the, the kind of place where you go when you meditate. And it's complete consciousness, um, but it's a harmonious place where everything seems to be working together, at least when you can stay in that place. When you lose touch with it, then you might as well stop painting. The gold painting, yes. Well, some of these these paintings have sort of a notorious background. Um, I did that painting, and then I had a gentleman who sometimes would critique with me, and I asked him if he would come over and take a look at this painting and and the work that I've been doing, and he didn't like it. And I went into a real funk. I mean, that was that was hard to take. Um, and then I looked, at, and then I looked again at the painting. And here, once again, is an, the idea of putting it down and then covering it up. And I just took the gold paint and I thinned it as as, as much as I could, so that it just it it just barely covered what was underneath. You could still see it, but you couldn't make out any really make anything out. And a little bit after that, there were, I got when I was teaching at Manchester by the Sea. I got something in the mail that was a teacher's competition that one of the art schools in Boston was was doing. Just on a lark, I put that painting in, and I got first prize, not as a painting, but as a three-dimensional object. Other people were working with metallic paints, um, and. I don't think they're very acceptable on the whole, um, but they they do create a sheen sometimes that worked with the, these uh, hanging paintings, and they caught the light in an interesting way because they're three dimensional, and um, there's something about the weaving in and out of the colors, and weaving is an interesting process anyway. It's very meditative, and it's very ancient. And I think it, you know, once again, this may have been sort of during the feminist period when I was exploring ways of working that weren't quite so masculine, like stretch paintings, which I've always felt were a little bit on the masculine side. And I like the idea of just the, the cloth. Talking about my husband, Frank, who I married in 1991, um, and who was Oh, my very good friend and supporter. His name was Frank Weston Benson II. He was the grandson of the American Impressionist painter Frank Benson. And when I um, moved into his 
into his house. Um, it was full of Frank Benson paintings, which I'm sure had an influence on me. I was spellbound to be able to spend as much time as I wanted in front of a Benson watercolor or an oil painting. I mean, it wasn't like going to the museum and having to take it all in in one go. I could go back and look at different, different light and so forth. I found a piece of wire fencing, very small grid. I think it's called hardware cloth. And um, I began to just lay that down on the paper and trace around it. And then eventually, um, I, when I was using watercolors with it, I would just drop the watercolor in and let it be whether it was a perfect grid or not. I was never concerned with making the perfect grid, but I was concerned in the organization of the page or the, or the canvas or whatever it was to, to create um, a composition where I could experiment with color and texture. And I, I think I tried everything. I used cloth to create a grid. I did some three-dimensional grids and I continued to do the grid for quite a long time to the point where I was no longer creating squares or rectangles but creating, a, um, as you know, the, the painting with the red crosses on it. ago when my husband died, I pretty much stopped painting for the oh, better part of a year and a half. I mean, I, I'd go out to the studio, but and I'd kind of fool around, but it wasn't. I just couldn't get serious about it. I couldn't get in touch with anything. And then one day I just went out and I thought, you know, I'm always being told to just come out here and play. And really, that painting is a lot about play. And, and kind of childlike play, you know, just letting letting the medium do whatever it wants to do, and um, just just so I just instead of a brush, I well I think I did use a brush, a brush and a palette knife. I just started to slather the paint on thick and and just joyously and and with abandon. And I was so amazed at the results. I mean, it, they were so spontaneous and fresh, and people's response to them was, you know, they, they, they saw something in energy in them, I think. So from there, it led to my just using a palette knife. And what I was finding was that if I put the paint on thick, really thick, and layered it, that I got an intensity, a saturation of color that I had never been able to get in any other way. And it created a texture that was, and every, and I did a whole series, I think they're by 18 panels, or 12 by 12, and I called the F series. And they're all, they're all quite different, both in the color and in the texture. Um, and um, I don't think I've ever hung anything on my wall that has got as many comments as that group of paintings and um, I I had a lot of fun with them I did some larger ones um, which which I think in in some ways in the the, the size of course it, it creates more of an impact um, and I used to work very large now I, I don't work quite as large I work both small and big um, I like to work a little and I like to work big and Anyway, that that gave me the saturation of, saturation of color and the texture that I'd always wanted. The the interesting thing about the Ebb series is that I began to relate to the environment around me, um, and I think that also happened after my husband died. I think I was so involved in other things that it was like I was aware of Cape Cod, obviously, and the light and and how beautiful it was. But that, it was a different experience for me after he died. It was like 
would walk the dog and take this thing, these things where I was taking them in. And so they began to show in the paintings. I began to look at the, the way the light affect the water at different times of day. And I was trying to get some of that in those paintings. He was very supportive. And when he died three years ago, um, and I couldn't paint for quite a long time, uh, but when I finally did, I ended up doing some paintings for him. And the, the last painting that I did is actually for him. Um, it's called uh, Remembering and Forgetting which is what grieving is really about. Um, also did a small painting called Grief, um, trying to, to work it out, to get it out of my system, to get it out in the open where I could look at it because I'm such a visual person. I mean, I, I sort of have to look at my emotions as well as to feel them. So that is, that those events were very important in my life and at that time, and um, I still feel his his influence and and his support. Mm -hmm.